Okay, so it looks like uh, all the uh, participants we're expecting at the moment are, are on board. Uh, of course, there's always going to be some late comers, but we'd like to get underway and value your time and respect you for, uh, for turning up on time. Uh, so my name is uh, Thomas Bywater. Uh, I've been with Jinko for six years now. Uh, my background is as an uh, engineer and as an electrician. Uh, so I'm always really interested to hear about the latest tech and what's going on in the industry. Uh, so that's why we're really excited to be presenting uh, information on the end type technology and also the way that panels are going uh, as we move forward. Largest uh, solar module manufacturer across the last five years. So we've shipped more panels than anyone has ever shipped 70 gigawatts. Uh, the market share worldwide is 12.6. Is um, and not only do we have a compelling market presence, but we've also got that technical background. So we're always looking to push the envelope on the quality of the panels through our partnership with DuPont. The cell efficiency record that you'll see there, 24.9. And of course, number one in bankability. So here in Australia, we've also got a great record that uh, you can lean on when talking to your end users, your end clients. Uh, number one in shipments last year for Australia in the distribution sector uh, with 500 megawatts shipped and 22% uh, market share according to Sunwiz analysis. Uh, and that comes off the back of 10 years of building that uh, here in Australia from our, our locally owned subsidiary. So been here in Australia for a decade, got some serious roots, got some panels on the ground. And uh, we've done everything from the small houses that you're familiar with to the bigger projects, uh, such as the Bungala uh, solar farms in South Australia, which, which I've visited and very, um, very compelling to see the impact that solar can make on that grid in October going to pure solar for, for the first time in October on a, on a single day that the whole state of South Australia ran on solar. So very exciting to be a part of that. And we hope to um, do similar things like that with yourselves um, off the back of our developments with high efficiency panels and the new larger panels in the Tiger Pro series. So I've got Daniel Sullivan standing by uh, from Formbay just to talk about some of the uh, benefits of the uh, serial number valid validation scheme. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to hand that over to Dan, who's going to join <coughs> me in a moment. Thank you, Thomas. Hello, Daniel. Can you hear me? Yeah, mate, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you, just a little bit low on my side. Okay, cool. So what I might do is I'll share the screen. Uh, good Fantastic. afternoon, everyone else. Uh, so I'm just going to share my PowerPoint. Um, well, before I do that, I, uh, thank you first and foremost for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, Jinko was one of the first participants to or one of the first manufacturers to step up um, for SPV. Um, today, it's, it's going to be a short presentation on uh, who Formbay is, for those of, those of you who don't know Formbay, um, and also about the solar panel validation service, which is unique to Australia. Um, so uh, what, what we'll do is I'll, I'll start with my presentations. Uh, my presentation, I'm sure there's a... I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a Q&A session at the end of my presentation or at the end of the whole presentation for anyone that's got questions. But, um, but why, don't, why don't I just jump in, dive straight in. And, uh, and I've, Thomas, I'm, I'm, I believe I've only got 10 minutes. Is that right? Oh, that's right, yes. Okay, cool. So uh, let's get started. Um, can, Thomas, can you see my screen now as opposed to my video? Uh, yes, we're just seeing it now with the uh, top header bar as well. So I think you need to go into presenter view. Is that okay. in uh, PDF that we're doing this? Uh, PDF. Um, yeah, okay, no worries. Well, then it's all good. Okay. I just need to work out how to get full screen, just two seconds. So control L. Okay, so that should be full screen now. So, um, cool. So what we'll do is, um, first of all, Formbay's been around for, we're coming up to 10 years now. So um, we've been, uh, I think we're first incorporated in 2011. Um, I start, I'm the single owner of Formbay. Um, I started the concept of Formbay uh, in 2009, 2011, uh, sorry, 2009, 2010 inside a previous company, which I exited from, in uh, 2011, which I went on to start or um, specialise in, in the company that's now known as Formbay. 
Um, my background is uh, web design and web development. And we basically saw a need for uh, a digital workflow that, uh, that basically allowed for uh, the efficient processing of compliance paperwork. So when I first started the company, uh, or first started um, ST or in renewables or in terms of rooftop solar and subsidies or such as STCs and RECs, we would have to submit those applications through to the clean energy regulator or aura at the time. Um, it involved a lot of paperwork um, and involved a lot of data entry, but also what came with that was, you know, installers, um, solar retailers, they were sending us their the, the um, STC application forms, or their paperwork and, and their associated paperwork, they were posting them, those that, that paperwork to us, they were faxing them, the paperwork to us, and they were also emailing, them, e emailing that paperwork to us. Um, at, at, on our side, we had to, we used to have to employ people to data enter. And believe it or not, there's still some rec agents out there that still do, um, uh, still do data entry and still do, do paper forms. Um, this wasn't sustainable. We had, at the time, I think 16, 16 data entry people, um, data entry and all this paperwork that, um, that would come from solar installs. That eventually led to um, uh, like a whole bunch of problems. You know, for instance, um, calculation of the, the, the STC subsidy or the, RA, the, the, the REC subsidy at the time, um, installers would guess that, or, or they'd have their own calculation for that. They wouldn't guess it, but they'd have their own calculation without realizing that it was a different calculation, uh, a different formula for different zones uh, in Australia. Um, they would make mistakes in, say, the, the way a street name's spelled, or they would use the wrong street type, et cetera, which are all just, stuff that we all live with. And normally, like we wouldn't see that as a major problem, but at the end of the day, um, these, are, these, these applications are uh, effectively applications for a synthetic commodity, which is known as renewable energy certificate. And that's based on you know, the renewable energy target legislation. And what's on the other side of creating these certificates are liable parties which are energy intensive companies, they have to buy these certificates each year. So, um, so the CER quite rightly, um, the clean energy regulator that is, need every single um, address, customer name, um, uh, you know, the makes and models that were installed, everything has to be absolutely character perfect because it goes into a legal register and the evidence that goes into behind that at the STC application has to be um, true and correct to, to, to the best of our abilities, but they also have to audit to make sure it's true and correct because they're approving um, a synthetic commodity that is, uh, goes into a market that, you know, I think it's up to a billion dollars is, um, is spent on STCs um, each year. So it's, for a, a, a lot of the guys out there, it's, um, or for, for the, Back then, when it was first starting out, it was just a, uh, another paper form set. So we essentially got rid of all the data entry, got rid of all the paperwork, and we created FormBay. And FormBay basically provided all the calculations, it sanitized all the data, such as address, um, it made sure all the, the makes and models were from the CC, it was it validated all the, the, all the CC installers were approved and that they could uh, do the install. Only to make sure that once it was uploaded to CER, that we wouldn't have any um, knockbacks on the basic stuff, such as spelling mistakes, etc. So, and also at the, time, at the same time, we, we were always constantly seeking to prove that that the install did take place. So we're always asking for photos and so forth. In 2010, I remember getting um, a bunch of site audit site audit requests from the regulator. And what would happen was I, at the time I was uploading STC applications, I knew that they'd taken place, but I was conducting phone audits. That's how we were working back then. The CER, um, I remember they asked for uh, what, what was known as a site audit, which pretty much 
was an email and come through and say, listen, for this STC application, we'd like to see these four, these four photos. Uh, a photo of the switchboard open, a photo of the DC isolator, a photo of the panels installed, and a photo of the inverter installed. And while you're there, we would like to see a photo of all the barcodes of the solar panels. So I remember receiving for um, one solar retailer that we were doing the STC applications for, we, I remember receiving something like 300 site audits and it was a huge undertaking. We were there, we were, I, I, I didn't get home until I think it was Sunday morning. Um, um, it was just crazy. And we had to get those audits done so we could get the STCs approved. Um, so that's why, um, you know, to avoid the, the solar installer having to go back out on the site and to, you know, avoid the solar installer asking the homeowner to take the photos, um, you know, i.e. jumping up on the roof and taking photos of the barcodes. Um, what we did was we, we thought about getting a solution or we sought to get a solution that would um, essentially allow the installer to capture all that evidence right from the get-go. So um, in 2011, I think that's when, when the iPhone came out, we launched our first app. And that's when, um, that's when we, was, we started collecting all of those four photos, the isolator, the inverter installed, uh, the, the, the panels installed in the roof in the front of the house. Um, we were collecting that, those, those photos for 100% of our, our jobs that were coming through, or our SCC applications coming through, which meant that we're able to photograph or visually inspect each job. So that allowed us to mitigate a whole bunch of risk. And it also, because we made a mandatory at the start and because I couldn't afford to have any mistakes because agents have a surrender risk. So if anything goes wrong and it's fraudulent, the agent has to surrender the certificates back. So we're able to, um, you know, factor in and visually inspect each job and we, we could de decline STC applications if they didn't provide photographic, STC, uh, photographic evidence. And it was interesting, over the years, we've pretty much avoided all the, like, um, we've never had a real, a net, we've never had an enforceable undertaking. Um, and we've always required those photos to be supplied before we would click upload to the rep registry. Um, it meant that our growth was a lot slower than some, but um, there's a, more of a, uh, there's more of a, risk-based approach in the, in the sense that we were, we were careful. And it's simply because we're, you know, we're, we're, we've, been, we've built our company from the ground up. Uh, there's no fairy godmother that's come in and given us 50 million venture capital or anything like that. And there's, it's, it's a very basic business, the profit that, that I have or that I, I extract from the company, I plow back into it. Uh, which has led to us you know, being a fully fledged tech company with the privilege of, that, of having an audience, which is, um, which is amazing and such an innovative and, uh, and uh, clever and intelligent audience being the Australian solar industry with, this is our perfect little incubator. Um, it's 10 years of incubation, but um, hopefully we've got some, uh, some, some cool tech that, we're, that other parts of uh, industry will, will, will be able to adopt soon. Um, so, in the 10 years, Formbay's grown to, um, we've got about, about 12,000 installers and uh, solar installers registered. Um, STCs per week, we, we process between 170,000 to 180,000 STCs a week. Um, I think we've done, for, since 2018 to 2020, we've done 25 million STCs. Um, and we turn over about, you know, about 300 million a year. Um, we have a close relationship with ANZ, who provides liquidity and completely de-risks our STC market for us. So we essentially buy flow, sorry, we, we provide flow to ANZ. Um, where by far we've got 10 years of you know, um, experience dealing with apps or dealing with apps out in the field. Um, so we're, we're experts in that. Um, we understand the rec agent, um, the role of the rec agent and responsibility of the rec agent. Um, 
So that's another area of expertise for us. Um, we were selected and asked to participate um, in, the, in the development of what is now known as SPV, um, which is stands for solar panel validation. Uh, that was on the basis of that, the reason for that was to, to be brought in to eliminate uh, the risk of non-genuine panels and parallel imported panels being used in the improper creation of SCCs. So uh, that's a, you know, prior to, oh, back, back in the day, there's rec agents that would have to surrender back $1.2 million worth of STCs, plus also make good on replacing all those, all those installs that were behind it, the STC applications, replacing those panels with, um, with accredited panels, or i.e. making good. So there's a huge financial risk for rec agents. Um, so that the, the concept of, you know, the, you know, the, the CEO was able to see that, well, there is technology that can work in the field. Uh, there is a company such as Formbay who's out there uh, scanning barcodes for their barcode scanner. Uh, they're very, we were verifying serials ourselves. We were, we were running, um, we had our own algorithm that was checking the, the prefix and the suffix um, similarities because we identified it as a risk. But, um, but yeah, but then eventually, uh, you know, the SPV made it very, very clear. Um, we've also gone on to, it's taken us three years to become ISO 27001 certified. So we understand our role as a, as a tech company to the, in, the, in, the, in the amount of data that we hold. Um, a lot of companies don't, um, don't, yeah. So uh, sorry about that, Chiara. I'm, I'm going to just flip through now. Um, so now we're going to solar panel validation. The basic game in solar panel validation or SPV is the, the manufacturers upload the serial numbers or the flash test data onto a, a database, a hosted database. We provide that data to participating apps uh, that are in the industry. Um, the CER provide a faster approval process or a faster turnaround time. So often the STCs are the last part of um, the, the, the job's income. So they're waiting for the STCs to be approved because you, you apply after the job's been done. So the faster we can make that for our installers and our retailers, the better. Uh, Jinko provide their, their solar, solar, sorry, their STC, sorry, not STC, their flash test data onto um, our, our service and as the, bar, as the installers scan the bar, barcodes uh, on the back of the truck, it checks off against the, the manufacturer. Um, that gives our clients or the solar retailers and other people's clients, um, that gives their, them their SCCs faster. If they don't do that, it takes up to two weeks. Um, so the form bay process, um, I've, I've just been told to wrap it up. I, I actually, I'm sorry, I should should practice this, but um, once I get to, once I get chatting, I can't stop. We um, provide a platform, an app, and we also provide um, uh, compliance services in the background there, and also the ability to trade those STCs in the market. Um, our app is uh, you know, provides barcode scanning, electronic signatures. We also do uh, dig digitization of DocuSign. We were doing electronic forms and e-signatures before DocuSign. Um, but that's something that, that's our new platform that we're offering to the market out to other, not, um, outside of the solar industry. Um, we've got the, our web platform, which we've just gone through, um, undertaken, a, just gone through a massive renovation there and to, to, to move to React, um, which is awesome. It's about to come online. Um, and the big thing is now over the, over the back of that, we've had, or over the years, we've collected all this photographic evidence and both from you know, aerial imagery and satellite imagery and also evidence or photos from uh, installs. So we've got two main areas um, that we're focusing on now is uh, we can now analyze the, the roof of a, of a property and see if there's solar panels there. So um, hopefully that will be a microservice that we can provide to um, government and, and also um, uh, our clients in terms of identifying if solar is there and where the solar should go. So uh, if I had more time, I'd elaborate on that. It's, it's three years and a lot of money that's going to that service. Uh, and then on the other side, um, we've got the, our uh, Inverter Neural Network, which is the image classifier. 
that now classifies the uh, the flow that is provided for uh, the inverters and uh, the panels installed. So making sure that, that evidence is true and correct, that they've already installed in the past, take photos of different things. But yeah, so guys, thank you very much. I'm um, sorry I went over time there, but, um, but um, as you can probably all, um, uh, probably all, yeah, you probably, it's very hard to talk within 10 minutes. So sorry about that and uh, thank you. Thanks. Thank, thank you very much, Daniel. Uh, so just to uh, recap and go over a little bit of what Daniel said there. So Form Bay worked with Jinko and, and some others to set up the serial number validation program. And this program allows us to get paid as quickly as we now do in the industry. So we should all bow down to Daniel and say thank you for that. Um, myself mm. as an installer, I've certainly appreciated the uh, quicker turnaround time on the SDC claims. Um, the, the other thing that uh, Daniel mentioned is that it's very good to take the serial number shot of the number under the glass of the panel. So the serial number is kind of like a currency and uh, the best uh, form of evidence for the clean energy regulator or the regulators that will come uh, is the serial number under the glass. So the under the glass, you can imagine it's very hard to change or forge or what have you other stickers on other parts of the documentation are more vulnerable to change. So please, as much as you can, when you're scanning those, um, scan them on site with the GPS locator at the install site and scan the barcode under the glass. That's our top recommendation on that topic. I'm just going to quickly uh, share my screen across just to run a couple of points before I introduce uh, Dan Su. Uh, so on your screen there, you should see the Jinko N-Type introduction. Um, so we're really excited today to be talking about the N-Type. I'd just like to leave you with a couple of thoughts. Um, so this N-Type opens the door for you to differentiate your business from others out there that are just doing any old panel. So when you're listening to the presentation from Dan and the others today, think about how the N-Type can help you. So the, the kind of questions you'll want to have in your mind are, uh, what is good about the end type? What sets that apart? Um, and what does that mean in terms of space saving for me when I'm doing bigger systems with batteries and stuff like that? Because essentially what end type gives you is a panel that uh, lasts longer and also a panel that is more compact. And as we know, the end type uh, technology degrades at a slower rate. So all products, doesn't matter if it's coffee machines or cars, they sort of wear out over time. And the same for solar panels, they go down in production, but the end type goes down less and it also has less light induced degradation. So it's a very powerful um, story to share with your end user customers as to why they should choose your installation business. And of course the warranty is longer on the end type as a result of that. So um, keep that in mind when you're looking at the product that you uh, plan to install for your clients. Love to have you take a look at the detail of the end type. We've got a 20 year product warranty on the white back sheet 390 and 370 and an even longer uh, one on the black back sheet 390. So without further ado, I would like to uh, hand over to Dan. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and you're gonna see uh, Dan's, uh, scan. Dan's screen come up on there. So just really pleased to introduce Dan Sue, who's gonna take over now with a detailed presentation on the topic. Hi, hi everyone. Um, hold on, I need just to make sure my slides is working. Yep. We can see that, Dan. Oops, <laughs> I'm sorry, let me, let me just turn it off. Yeah, okay. Um, hi, everybody. So, um, so to, today, let's just have a quick go through the product Thomas just has mentioned. So we have N-Type uh, coming to, so it, it's really about what is to be expected in 2021 from Jinko. Um, as we all know, Jinko is always leading in the technologies. And uh, so this year we are, in, we are the first to introduce uh, N-Type, uh, technically we have introduced the last year. So we'll be fooling into onto this N-Type technologies. Um, and we also going to introduce this uh, pro type, uh, pro, pro series, um, which is uh, the largest cell technologies. Um, so a little bit backgrounds, I think we already covered. So I will be quickly 
um, through this. Um, but as I said, uh, Jinko is very leading in this um, in this uh, in this industry and technical aspects. Um, and we are the first to try out a lot of new technologies, and especially. Uh, usually it would be launched in the larger solar farms uh, first place. So in the highlights here, we have done a Bowman solar farm that is 120 megawatt with the first bifacial solar panels. Um, and uh, the bachelor is the first tiger uh, with a tiling ribbon uh, with the uh, this small three megawatt with this tiger pro 550 watt, which is the first large cell panels over 500 watt ever delivered to Australia. Um, and we have just uh, um, commencing a new project is called New England, which is a 500 megawatt, uh, also the largest solar farm in Australia. So, um, so the, the always a question about uh, uh, what is to expect. Like last year, if you're looking at 2017, 2018, the answer is simple, like whatever 400 watt, whatever like 330 watt you can get, just uh, you can always shop from one supplier, you can choose from one supplier to another. Uh, but things being very, uh, I'll say chaotic or being changed quickly, uh, fast paced in 2019, where everyone, all the, every uh, uh, large manufacturers in the industry start to launch different size of products. Um, before we, we never were really talking about the cell, the size of the cell. Um, but now it's it's a it's a key topic uh, that you define the modules. So not just only by mod looking at the modules by the power class, but we would also be looking at uh, the sizing of the cell and how do we actually design uh, into the module. Um, so there was the 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 industry would uh, the flow of the industry is that the upstream but eventually going for a larger cell, as, as we all know, the, the efficiency of modules will be simply kind of you know, meters per square. So it makes sense for the, the, the cell supplier to go thinner and go to wider uh, of a bigger cell. But of course, the, it's, it, it have to be based on an improvement of, of cutting technologies, improvement of cell productions, and also uh, this, the, eventually the size of the cell need to be suitable for our good modules uh, design. So you would see the 163, 166, and now we are launching this 182 or even larger cells, uh, which is available in the market. Um, as for now, we believe 182 uh, is the a, is a, is a best uh, cell size for uh, the module design. Um, and uh, today um, we are introducing three products to the Australia market. Um, and uh, that it's what we call the Tiger Pro series. Um, so it covers to the 72 cell half cut that will be mailing on the uh, solar farms and it will be available in monofacial and bifacial. Uh, the power class around 540 to 550 watts depends on the variations. Um, but well, we do also see them on some commercial roofs. Uh, it does make sense for a high power class. Um, but we also have introduced the 60 cell modules, um, which is, um, uh, 1.8 meter, slightly wider, uh, but that will be more suitable for um, different scenarios. It can be installed either on the residential or could be on the, uh, the commercial room. Um, but we also have this Tiger Pro 40, 40, 54 cells, and that will be the most compact version that will uh, end with a maximum power class of 500, uh, 415. So just to quickly go through some uh, uh, advantages of technologies here, yeah, we're talking about half cut for many years. Um, it, people may think it's, it's an old technology, but in fact, there are a lot of improvements throughout the years. Um, so there's a cutting, the cutting has been improved for the half cut. So uh, it's not a method of saving, saving costs, you know, cutting them half. It's, it's actually an advantage to have cells split in half to control the voltage and the current of the cell and reduce the hotspot um, risk. Um, where we also apply the multi, multi bus bus. So previously we would have five bus bus and now it's improved to nine to 10, uh, but it doesn't essentially mean the more the better. We would always have to look at the size of the bus bar and also um, the, the shape of the bus bar. So Jinko would choose a circular bus bar that in, that will introduce more lights reflection from the cell back uh, from back to the um, glass to be collected. Um, where traditionally a triangular or a, a square bus bar would have more losses in this sectors. 
um, and the boss bars are now, now thinner to avoid shadings. Um, and uh, that is a combination and being tested um, throughout like 10, 11, uh, but we would choose the nine or 10 as, a, as the best suitable size. It uh, depends on the cell size is either 182 or 166. Um, so the other improvement obviously is the degradation. So uh, besides N type, even for the normal P type, you, what you would recognize um, is the degradation has been improved from previously we say 3% to 0.5%. Now to nowadays, it's only been 2%. Uh, that uh, because we have introduced uh, uh, the gladium dopings um, and uh, improved uh, um, module uh, BOMs that like bomb of material that including uh, using a wide EVA, tandem back sheet and, and all POE options depend uh, for the by monofacial. Um, any other improvement is on the annual degradations. Um, if, if you're two years back, we will be calculating uh, like 0.75% per annual. Uh, but frank, uh, tech, uh, but nowadays we are, we are promoting 0.45, which will be greatly uh, helping you to shaping your financial modeling. Um, and uh, that would have more impacts on the um, end types when we're gonna talk, talk when we're having uh, end types on the next slide. So tiling ribbon, that's another technology we have introduced in 2019. Um, and that it's just essentially overlapping of using of cell, but to pushing that for efficiency, which you will be seeing most on our N-type products as well. Um, so before we go further, we will have a very frequent questions about the pro series as people are looking at the data sheet, they'll say, okay, the current is a little bit high. And um, I just like to address this as uh, when you're looking at current, there's two categories. One is the uh, short circuit and the other one is max, uh, max um, MP. So when we're looking at the, the max shot, uh, when you're matching the max maximum short circuit current, just with your inverter, just make sure you're matching the, um, so just make sure your short circuit current should be always lower than uh, what the inverter is. But when you are talking about uh, IMP, uh, it is, well, I would say okay to have IMP slightly higher than the MPPT allowance. What is, um, is so in theory, you will have some clipping loss. Um, but uh, because you are over, um, so in short, the, the, because your um, panels are, are over tint than the inverter, so you have 6.6 .6 kilowatt versus your five kilowatt inverter. So your power clipping always happens first before you have that current clipping happen. So if you're just talking about pure current clipping loss, it's, it's, it is negligible over a year throughout the year, like 0.001%. Um, where your power clipping is most important uh, to, to notice. Um, so matching your ISC, that's important just on the safety aspect. So uh, essentially is you have to understand your ISC and I, uh, your current, uh, your short circuit and in, in the safety aspect and the performance aspect. Uh, we do have a statement. If you have any questions, just make sure you contact us so we can share your statements around it um, and uh, some technical notes. Um, the other uh, frequent questions is about the modules being increased the size and uh, uh, being reduced the, the, the thickness of the module, um, which we would like to introduce a new, which have introduced a new uh, shape design. So the, the frame is, has been reduced from 40 to uh, 40 to 35 or from 35 to 30 millimeters. That's uh, which benefits mostly for the logistic terms. Uh, that you can pack more pallets, uh, more panels in one pallet. Uh, but uh, for, for the consideration of uh, strengths, uh, we have uh, done all the tested as the strengths are now being, uh, being reinforced uh, with more structures and it's a thicker, uh, it's a thicker materials and the different shapes. Um, so in regards of uh, if the modules can be installed on wing region, on high wing regions, we do have um, issued uh, in informations about the clamping zones, which uh, which you will be, uh, which which you will be looking at the sweet spots, um, and then it gives you the maximum uh, mechanical loading. But or if you're off the space, it's still allowed. Uh, but you would have to e evaluate your wing load and the mechanical load of the modules. End of the day, we will ensure the module will not uh, have a high degradation or high losses um, under the high strong wind. 
Uh, but an end, uh, but we also have done the material test just to test the cell uh, where the the frame one and all the glass will not be easily break uh, even under the high load. Um, so coming back to the end type, um, uh, we, we just a little bit pressed on this on the time there. Um, what we call the extra series. The reason being called extra series uh, is uh, it, it's essentially a similar module when we look at the power class. It's uh, 370 watt, 4, 390 watt, um, or in all black variations. But when you compare to 370 watts, like it's they are both 370 watt, what are the differences? Um, you'll be looking at the size, you're looking at the efficiency and degradations, warranties, and all these aspects. Um, so I would like to focus on the 370. It's a new most, it's the newest products that we have launched. Um, and the 390 we have launched now in uh, all black variation as usually in all black, the efficiency were dropped a little bit. So now we are able to achieve this in 2021 is because of the improvement of cell technologies. So Jinko has introduced a new technology called HOT 2.0, uh, um, which is a Topcom uh, untype technology that allowed uh, slightly better performance. And uh, um, we would uh, also to, uh, and, and the, that allows to have a module that is compact and small in the shape. So as you can see, the 370 is only 1.9, 1.69 meter. Um, and it's also light and compact to be used compared to uh, the, the regular 370s, 166 on the market also where we have in Jinko. Um, so we're talking about efficiency, you're talking about losses, degradations, and why they're important. So firstly, um, there's a term of LID that when you when the panel start to expose to the sun in the first 72 hours, basically it will degrade, okay, by 2%, uh, 3% depends on, on the P-type technologies. Um, where in N-type, the degradation is less than 1%, so it's a very good at anti-LID. Um, where your linear, linear degradations, uh, as we are using more, more high ends of good material, quality materials, your linear degradation is also very low across the 30 years or 20 years of the lifetimes. Uh, so which is important for customers who would invest then especially looking at the IRR very precisely um, as you would have, and also the end type combined with the um, uh, TR technology, we have a better working temperature, you have a better uh, low light performance. So what it essentially mean, it means it has more energy and more generations across the year, not only the first year, but across the 30 years. So all these will be accumulated um, step by step. So if looking at some PVC simulation, if you compare the N-type modeling and the P-type modeling, you will see straight away in the first year, you have like a five, four or two, six megawatts, uh, when like around 2% of generations in the first year. Um, where um, starting the second, uh, it will be keep accumulated for the over 20, 30 years. And that will uh, make a difference of, uh, in here it's only 200 megawatt. It doesn't seem much, but when you, when you consider for this 100 kilowatts, when you consider it, um, you know, it's 20 or 30 cents per watt, you're looking at a good 50 Ks. Or if you're getting LGC, just increasing by another one kilowatt. Uh, and you're getting $60 for the LGC, that's even better. You know, you're looking at probably a 10, 100 case. Um, so you do your financial modeling and do your ROI for your customer when you're doing this end type and you straight away, you will see the benefits accumulated across the years. Um, and as I said, we are promoting with a better warranty. So that's a 20 years workmanship warranty instead of 12 years. And it will give you a, a longer performance warranty as well. So um, trying to pushing through, so how, uh, so that's an ultimate question, like how do we choose in good, with uh, high power or high efficiency? So the 440, we launched that um, in a 60 cells, looking at 1.8 meter is slightly big and 23 kilowatt. I would say that's essentially the biggest you can put on the roof. Like if you consider carrying by one person and lift it on to, to two, a two story roof, uh, it is hard, but it's still possible. Um, so when we talk and previously we're talking about, okay, commercial panels and we have residential panels people would consider okay uh like anything less than 2.2 by one it's a commercial pan uh, it's, it's a residential or bigger than two by one it should be a commercial uh but i think this 440 products is there to 
um, to sit in the middle. Okay, it, it, it's trying, to, it's, uh, it should be more uh, flexible to provide you the flexibilities that you can just stock one kind of panels and it can be all used on commercial, but also can be used on the residential. Um, 370 is another story. It's great, it's light, it's small size. You can be more flexible to fit on the roof. Uh, it's a good power class, and uh, at the end of the day, it also have the untyped um, uh, performance uh, and the TR performance that give you a better return of, of investment over long years. Um, so on the on the commercial, it, you really have to look at your play styles. Like, uh, are you are you more focused on the labeling? Are you more focused on using mechanics like crane and using uh, forklift, scissor lift? Uh, how do you handle your panels? You manually or uh, more relying on this equipment. Uh, and then you will be looking at the, the, the different choices. Either of them will be working. Um, like as I say, 440, it's a great, uh, it's great. You can you can stock them to use on, if you just, you're doing one or two commercial jobs per week, uh, maybe consider stocking them. It can be mainly focused on residential, but also be used on commercial. Uh, but uh, you can always, if you have a big, nice roof, you can always consider the 540 watt. Uh, but it is big and it is uh, it is uh, heavy, um, so for people who would or you, you should be considering using a crane if you um, using and two people to carry the panel. Um, but end of the day, you're gonna have to look at your layout, you look at your design, um, and uh, how do we budget your your systems? You know, especially when you're over a hundred, a thirty kilowatt or hundred kilowatt, you will have a lot of regulations and protections, and all these costs will accumulate. And at the point, so you would be thinking about, okay, can I save a thousand dollar, two thousand dollar from here and there, uh, just by out utilizing a different type of modules, or essentially you can providing the customer uh, an type solution, which um, which you may charge them a little bit higher, but it will also benefits them in the long term. Um, so. Uh, I would say that the cell efficiency and power class, it's, it's, it's all both important. We, we can't just looking at the power class and ignoring what's the efficiency. Otherwise you can always people who's pushing 600 watt, 800 watt, you can just stick two panels together and uh, it doesn't uh, helps with the situation, especially on the rooftop. Um, so N type 370 will be the most efficient modules in, in the series or in the market, I can say one of the most efficient. And the 440 is just the following as a, uh, but as a P type, it's very, uh, it's it, it, with the TR and P, P type, um, it's, it's a great panel to be used as well. 390 here, you will see the efficiency is not as high, but that's because uh, 390 is a choose or is a choice of, of you know to maximize the STC. The real performance of this module can achieve 400, 405, um, and when it's in all black, it's a slightly lower. So uh, it uh, the the max efficiency for this untyped Tiger 390 uh, or this uh, 66 cells is also 21.5. Uh, but just the choice of 390 just to better uh, accumulate it with the STCs. So end of the day, it's a, you know, it's a worker, Whopper versus a Big Mac, which one do you more like, which one do you prefer? Um, but each of them, you should uh, able to find some good selling point um, and it will be helping with your products, projects throughout and through. Um, so lastly, just uh, some fun topics is like, oh, if people considering by facial on the roof, um, I like say there's still a lot of challenges in uh, commercial sectors, um, even in the utility sectors to have by facial modeled and um, utilized. Okay, so, uh, it's, so theoretically on the roof, it's, it's interesting. It's a very good concept because you can technically paint your roof in different colors. Um, and the, the, the reflection from the albedo is most essential for the backside of the generation. Um, so that, that may be a plus for uh, uh, LGC works when you, you have more focus on the generation. Um, and the bifacial would give you some extra benefits or extra yield uh, throughout uh, you know, uh, winter series or throughout uh, uh, unpeaked period. Um, especially morning and afternoon when inverter is not kept. Um, so 
it will be working great with LGCs, and I we we see Jinko. We we like to see innovative designs. We like to see people be innovating. Maybe putting them on the car spot, uh, putting them uh, to be building integrated. Um, and the other benefits of bifacial is sometimes being required. It's a, it is power class A. Um, it, it is a dual glass. So these are some things you can consider, and we would like to happy to support them. Um, with, with some modeling and, and some uh, technical aspects. So in a summary, that's what we have looking at. So we have pro series. So in the 54 cells, 60 cells and 72 cells. Um, and we also have the N expert series with which are the N types in the 60, you know, the 66 and the all blacks. Um, so thank you for that. And uh, for a little bit housekeeping, we will have uh, another uh, Q and A sections at the end of all the presentations. So I'll give, give back to Thomas. Thank you. Thank you very much, there, Dan, for that presentation. Uh, that was really informative. Um, just sharing through my screen now. Also, just to mention some housekeeping uh, for those of you who are installers, uh, you can see the. Um, you can see on the screen an indication of the email for your CPD points. So Kiara from Jinko marketing team is handling that. If you could email your uh, name, your accreditation number and your company uh, through to uh, Kiara, Kiara can make sure that your CPD points are registered uh, for this presentation, which is eligible for CPD under CEC. So our next presentation is from Rene Ubrecht, who's going to be presenting from Greenbox on some grid protection techniques. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and get Rene to uh, share his screen and introduce his company and what services he can provide for yourselves. Uh, yes, Sorry, Rene. thanks, Thomas. And thank you, Jinko, for uh, allowing us to present during this seminar. Um, so a little bit about myself. Yeah, my name is Renee Ubrex. Um, I'm an installer myself, electrical contractor. Started, you know, as soon as John Howard introduced it. So I've been, as their class are now, some of the dinosaurs within the industry. Um, so been growing through, you know, starting off with the small one kilowatt systems and, and stepped up that way. Um, as we stepped up, of course, then we got into these scenario now where we need to require to put some in, uh, grid protection devices. Um, that's where I got introduced with, um, with Richard. Um, and together we designed the grid protection boards, which, you know, we'll just run through it. So I'll run through, you know, what is the requirements? When do you need to install it and all that sort of stuff? And then we'll, we'll show you some actual pictures, uh, which will be great for, you know, the installers among us, which we always like to see that sort of stuff. So let me start my um, presentation. Uh, okay. I'll just start. Excellent, that's looking good. Yes, I'll just get rid of that. Okay, so who are we? So we founded, the, the business was founded in 2016. Uh, initially it was designed to start, you know, with grid protect, uh, micro grids, uh, which is still a little bit of on in the background that is still going. Uh, and it actually, that will be uh, interesting stuff in, in the near future. But um, but for now, then we in 2017, we started more on designing the grid protection devices across Australia. So what is a grid protection board? Now, a grid protection device, um, you know, it's got some different names. Uh, some people call it just PD. Uh, uh, and, and it is required under, under AS4777.3.4.4.3 as they always tell me, the more points you put behind it, the more interesting it sounds. But basically, um, if you install a solar system uh, that is bigger than 30 kilowatts in inverter sizes, you're required to put a grid protection device. Uh, so grid protection device monitors the grid status. So voltage, uh, frequency, 
And if they are falling outside of these requirements, it needs to shut down your entire solar system. Uh, so now, as I mentioned, it's over 30 kilowatts. So I'll just run, we put a slide together here where it, it, it sort of breaks down the system so that you get a better understanding. So in, in a single phase or, or, or up to three phase, five kilowatts per phase, you don't need any grid protection device. You can just use your standard inverter that, that will do the requirements. The same with once you go over to, to the 15 to the 30 kilowatt system sizes, and mainly you will end up in a three phase situation. Uh, still under the 30 kilowatts. So as long as you stay just under that 30, you're still not required that to do that in any situations. Although there are some D, uh, distribution network centers that, uh, sorry, um, D, D, DSPNs that do require some phase balancing. So you need to check that with your local uh, authorities to make sure that you comply. But then once you step over that 30 kilowatt, as soon as you do, you know, 30.1, you straight away get into the grid protection device. And that will run up to 200 kilowatts uh, where you can just use a grid protection device. Um, anything over 200 kilowatts, you get into a different field uh, where you, know, you require complete different boards and complete different requirements from the DSPNs. Uh, but again, we can help you with that, that sort of part out as well. But at this stage, we're just focusing a little bit in this, this smaller range. Um, for this presentation. So, as I mentioned, I, I was an installer um, and, and when we you know, started to install the larger systems, uh, there was not really a product on the market. So I got to know Richard and I said, mate, we need some materials and we'll put it all together. Um, but it worked, but it wasn't that I would say I was proud of it. So we sat down and we decided to start working out a proper board. Um, it's one, you know, as you can see, we've got a perfect scutcheons in front of it. So it's not when you open a board and you see a whole bunch of wires straight away, it's a nice looking switchboard. At the same time, we, we are allowed to say, okay, we wanna have a main switch in there. So with, with that, we, we can supply you a 100 kilowatt or the 200 kilowatt, uh, 200 amp board, sorry. Um, which comes standard with a main switch, which is an advantage because you could potentially mount this board further away from, from your existing switchboard. Although, again, check with your DSPN. Some DSPNs require to have a grid protection device or at least the monitoring device of the grid protection to be mounted near or close to the main switchboard. So be aware of that. Um, for the rest, after the main switch, we've put in a, a distribution board underneath. So if you've got multiple inverters, you can then wire them straight away into this switch board and use this board as your uh, solar DB board at the same time. You let us know by what you would require if you will make an order in it. So the right circuit breakers can be installed. Um, alternatively, as we're seeing, the, like the panel size is now starting to increase, inverter sizes are increasing as well. Um, you could otherwise opt for to use your main switch as if you're using a single inverter just um, to, to eliminate the part and just wire it straight away into the board. Um, and then on the, on the right hand side of the, uh, the board, we got um, the mains pro. We're using a mains pro that is programmed to the settings that the DSPN requires. So you have over voltage, your under voltage, your over frequency, under frequency, and your rock off. All of these settings can be pre-programmed if you let us know what is required or being given by a DSPN. Um, the mains pro will monitor the, the settings of the network. If they fall outside of it, of course, it will drop it off. Once the setting, once the the network goes back into you know the requirement um, the mains pro will automatically restart after 60 seconds um, for the rest we've got uh, test links in there so if you require by your dspn as well to put in an injection test um, that is can be arranged as well and and the test links are there to you know help the the, the person who does that test 
to easily mount that. On top of it, we got the grip protection uh, device, uh, not a grip protection, but also the surge arrestor, uh, built in standard with the board. So it's, it's a neat looking complete package. And especially now we're using the larger panels, you know, we can easily um, get that all connected together. Um, for the rest, the final thing that we, we allowed as well, as we are now getting more and more, uh, we want to know the consumption monitoring. Uh, we have made room in this board where you can put in your energy consumption metering um, and wire that straight into here as well. So there is a 10 amp three phase circuit breaker for that allowed in this as well. Um, so I'll just run through a couple of standard questions uh, that are getting asked a lot. So for instance, if we would install a 35 kilowatts in solar panels and a 29 kilowatt inverter, do we require a grid protection? The simple answer is no, you do not, as the inverter is under the 30 kilowatts. Simple. Um, if you install, um, and they've just um, installed a 35 kilowatt solar panels with a 29 kilowatt solar inverter. Do we need to, um, sorry, they made a mistake there. Anyway, oh, what have I done now? Go back. <laughs> sorry, guys. Oh. Um, if I limit the solar uh, export to below 30 um, to the grid, do I need, still need to install this grid protection device? Yes, you still need to because your solar inverter is still bigger than 30 kilowatts. And potentially you could add later on more panels. So they are a bit worried about it. So yes, you do need to install one. Um, so, and the other question, they've left that double as well. All right, then we're just gonna look at some of our future, like a couple of projects we've done where we've installed a grid protection devices in multiple locations. So. Sometimes you get in large commercial jobs, uh, multiple buildings where you need to install the solar system. So how do you control that all those solar inverters will drop out if you're required to drop them out? So what we then do is we still install the grid protection device at the main switchboard where we're monitoring the grid uh, status. And if that is then falls outside of it, what we can do is just install a contactor board on the near the other inverters on the far side um, in order to drop them out. So we can do that either via a hardwired link or you can, we can even do a wireless radio link if the distances are too great. So in that way, you know, you can save a fair bit of time and money if that is um, not possible or, or, or it requires you to, you know, to dig up concrete. Uh, in this way, you can just do a wireless link and that will solve that issue. Um, so that brings me to the end of this uh, conversation. So I'll give you back to, uh, to Thomas and um, yeah, I'll see you at the end. Thank you very much there, uh, Rene. Um, I'll yeah. just get you to uh, sh stop sharing the, um, yeah. stop sharing the screen go, and mate. then we'll pick yeah, you up. Sorry. Okay, fantastic. Looks like we've dropped off, that's great. Um, so today we've been talking about the changes in uh, panels. So we've been looking at, for example, the advances with N-Type. We've been looking at the uh, new Tiger Pro and how they're physically larger. And there's some things to think about and how we're doing more and more larger systems. That's why we're looking at the safety, uh, which we just discussed with Rene there for the grid protection. We're seeing more and more of the grid companies that haven't had this requirement for Rockoff to, to fit in with the standards and start to introduce that requirement. So there has been a few uh, jurisdictions where it wasn't required, but it will be going forward. So if you haven't looked at the grid protection space for the last 12 months, it's good to review that because there have been some changes um, in particular from May uh, going forward here in New South Wales. Um, just with respect to safety. So the, we've mentioned that the panels are getting bigger and that there are some things to think about. Uh, Solar Victoria has been uh, producing uh, some material on the safety of solar installations. Uh, WorkSafe, or now SafeWork New South Wales, uh, has also produced a checklist and a guide to safe installation uh, for, for New South Wales. And no doubt other markets have that as well. So do check with your local WorkCover or WorkSafe uh, entity 
if you do not have something like that in your area, it might be useful to refer to the New South Wales Guide. So essentially all of the jurisdictions are feeding off the same legislation with respect to the handling of solar panels and with respect to the edge protection concerns. So what you should be aware of in the industry is that the regulators have in response to injuries uh, started to look closer at our industry and that has resulted in a focus on edge protection and also how the panels are got from the ground to the roof. Uh, so with respect to the enhanced safety that is being required, or should I say enforced, so some of those rules have been in place for some time but not enforced. Uh, so the traditional way that we got panels onto the roof um, is with a ladder, um, carrying it up maybe with a backpack or maybe perhaps passing the panels up. In a lot of cases, that won't be the safe way to do it going forward. Now, because we're using uh, mechanical aids, such as a gator or a ladder lift or this kind of um, conveyor belt type setup, then that does open the door to do some of those larger panels like the 440. On the other hand, if you take the view that you do not like panels getting larger, you can go to the 370N and that panel has the same format essentially as the old 330 or 275 watt panels had. So um, what I would like to do now is to hand over to Sana, who's from Gamcorp, going to talk about some of the design aspects uh, with solar panels. So I'm just going to now stop, uh, shop it, uh, stop sharing my screen and we're going to see Sana Ashfar's screen come up. How are we going there, Sana? Having us, mate. Thank you for the introduction as well. Guys, I'm being cautious of time, so we'll get straight into it. Uh, my name's Sana. I'm the, one of the project coordinators here at GAMCorp. And uh, effectively what GAMCorp is, if you haven't heard from us in the past, is we're a structural engineering firm that um, goes and certifies the commercial installations on rooftops and also ground mount systems in Australia. So a bit about what we're going to do today. We'll go a bit more about what we do, the types of services we perform. Um, the main focus is going to be horizontal wind analysis and, and what we do to, to accommodate for wind when looking at the structure of a building. And then lastly, we'll end on um, some dead load deflection and, and what, what the only real uh, considerations are when we're looking at dead load, the major problems that we have within the industry. So let's get straight into it. The first slide is about us. So if you haven't heard, we, we've we been fortunate enough to work on some of the biggest rooftop and, and ground mount projects in Australia. Uh, we have, uh, you know, an extensive range of experience in different types of buildings, including shopping centers and high rises and, and larger stadiums and different things like that. So we've been very fortunate to kind of be given the responsibility and the, and the, and the opportunity to, to be a part of some really landmark projects. Uh, in recent times, we've also done uh, other avenues like roof sheet testing. So we're understanding how clamps interact with roofs and roof sheets in particular. Uh, and then the other industries that we do also, uh, you know, provide engineering services to uh, steel fabrication, playgrounds and bridges, commercial building modifications and, you know, poles and different things like that as well. But our main focus, about 70% of our business is around the, the solar industry. So looking at horizontal wind, so it'd be surprising for most uh, to know that, uh, you know, the weight of a panel isn't the, the biggest consideration or the, the biggest problem we have when we're looking at uh, installing panels on a roof. A lot of installers will commonly ask me, hey mate, can you just let me sit and let me know if the, the weight of the panels will, will, will be good enough for this building or this building to be able to hold it up. And the truth is that's, that's not the main concern. The main concern is what you're looking at now which is that horizontal wind load analysis. So as wind hits a building, it hits in all different directions. Um, the corners being you know, the one that's most affected because it hits it from this face and the other face. And now you're looking at this, this you know, uncontrollable kind of uh, you know, force that comes from all different directions hitting, hitting on a roof. Now, when, when it's initially designed, when you're an engineer, you're designing the building, you're assuming that the wind loads at the very high event is you know uniformly distributed over the whole roof. So you have a you have a set of wind, and every square meter is getting roughly the same amount of force. But now we're adding panels, and we're making them bigger, and we're making them bigger. And and what happens is that panel now is connected to these feet, and these feet are effectively now point loads. Instead of it being uniform distributed, you've got you know two square meters of area now of wind that's hitting that panel, and it's only putting pressure on these small pieces. Um, of connection points to the structure. Now, how the building, the building hasn't been designed for that. The, the roof sheet, a lot of the times hasn't been designed for that. So now we're saying, okay, now can we make it work? Now we know where the building wasn't initially designed for it, but now changing these wind loads and making them to point loads 
Um, how is that going to, you know, is, it, is the panels or clamps going to disengage from the building or is the building itself going to start failing in deflection, whether it's dead or live loads? So in, in saying that there's many factors, right? This is, these are some of the many factors that we have. The ones that hold more weight is something like the wind regions, as you guys would know, uh, as, as you get into the more tropical areas, um, in wind region D, you have a lot more exclusions and you have a lot more clamps or rails to accommodate for that high wind event. And that would hold more weight than, for example, if there's buildings around it shielding, uh, you know, the, the roof that you're planning to install on. So everything holds a, a certain amount of weight. Uh, and I don't want to say that the panel size is the biggest and most you know, critical thing. It's not, but uh, it does play a significant part in being able to make something get over the line and, you know, get all the corners and the edge zones of a building working as well. Uh, another really big one is is you know whether it's flush or tilt um, and how your your building um, you know how much of your building you can use can increase if you decide to go from you know a tilt mount system down to a flush system. Uh, you'll see these maps if you've seen our certificates in the past. You'll see these kind of maps that looks like this is a bird's eye view of a building, and these are the zones that you can see kind of. Uh, are affected differently based on wind. The corner being, you know, multiple directions of the highest, um, you know, uplift force generated by wind. And then you've got the edge zones, which have the full face of the building plus the roof area itself. And then as you go into the internal zone, that's where it's, uh, you know, you probably have most of your insulations because it's probably the safest and less, least affected by wind. Going on to actually what we're touching on about panels. Now, you know, Jinko has been probably leading edge in, 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 you know, providing bigger panels and different types of panel technical elements inside the panels as Dan Sue was talking about before. Uh, but the concern that we have from a structural point of view is that as panels get larger, uh, you know, the effect it has on buildings is, it can be quite significant. And as, as long as people have been in the industry, if and I've heard it many times from solo guys, I've been in the industry for 20 years or 30 years or whatever it is, um, you know, as these new things come about, it doesn't matter about your tenure in the industry because these are things that no one's facing in the industry. These are panels now that are twice the size that we originally had. The way it affects a building is, you know, twice as bad as well. So it's really important once you're looking at these commercial installations where you've got, you know, thousands and thousands of panels on a roof area, understanding, wait, this building was built, you know, 30, 40 years ago, or sometimes even more. Uh, I really highly doubt that, you know, this type of addition, not just dead load, but also the disengagement of the panel, this, this wind load has been taken into account. What things you can do, obviously reducing your tilt angles down, um, creating a flush, there, there, is, there are some positives in that. When you have flush uh, installations, you have the ability to add more rails uh, and different elements to, to have more fixings towards a roof. So these are things that we'll discuss with you if you ever would engage us to, to do work or if you had any general questions and uh, you say, oh, look, I'm, I'm planning to do a 30 degree tilt on a, on a high rise. We'll politely say that you know, there's some considerations there that you might need to look into that, that may not make that happen. Uh, but yeah, look, Jinko's 370 watts is the panel and, and the 440 watt, you know, Dan's told me a bit about it. Um, you know, it's better to see, I, I personally, we personally love when there's smaller panels that are, you know, giving you a lot more better output from energy point of view, because that really helps us, you know, get, get the whole roof certified. Dead loads, when dead load does become a concern is, uh, you know, God bless you guys and your, and your North Face roofs. I know you guys love them so much and, and, and there's good, and there's, you know, there's good reason for it. I'm not saying there isn't. Uh, but the only time dead load becomes a real problem for us is when you're overloading the north face of the roof or, or any, any one face of a roof. Uh, this, this type of structure, which is like a warehouse structure, it can be represented if you're cutting through it uh, by the orange lines there. It's, it's called a portal frame. A portal frame gets significant amount of its strength from its, its actual shape. Uh, so it, this, these, these columns are holding a certain amount of force. These roofs forces are on an angle to a certain degree with the certain you know, rafters and purlins that are designed to trans transpose that force down to the columns and into the slab. Now, if you're loading one half of a building with a significant amount of load that maybe it can accommodate, but it isn't balanced out or it's uneven, then what we end up seeing is that this, this, this one particular part of the roof has a huge amount of deflection. Now, mind you, this is exaggerated for the sake of being able to understand what I'm trying to say, but uh, there is a there is a significant deflection here. There's an upwards deflection here and both sides of the columns are being pushed out. So the building hasn't been designed again. Uh, it's been designed for a uniformly distributed wind load and a, a standard uniformly distributed dead load. And now you're adding a whole one side, you're, you're adding 10,000 panels on one side. And then on top of that, 
you, there's whole this whole new wind element that's you know changing this you know you know this nice spread out force into little little points um, that are directly on purlins. So then we have some really big concerns around not only uh, the dead load there in this particular case, but also how you connect these clamps to the structure if they're over the purlins directly, or if you're just connecting to you know 0.48 millimeters worth of roof sheeting. So there's a lot of considerations that are happening as as panels advance and as as we're getting you know more and more into the understanding ourselves from a structural point of view of how these panels uh, and, and these array frames are affecting our industry or, or the building industry. There's, there's, uh, I think the, the best thing to ask is that people keep an open mind that, you know, there's a lot of things that are changing and understand that that also means the installations parameters can change and, and your inclusions and, and on where you can install on a roof based on wind pressure will also change as well. Uh, so look, that's that's a, a quick summary of what we do. Very, very brief. I do thank you for your time and thank Jinko for giving us the opportunity to uh, to be a part of this. If there's anything you want, there's a, a solar email you can contact us on or a, a line. Uh, feel free to give us a call and, and we can discuss it further as well. Nine minutes, mate. I think I got there. Thank you very much, Santa. You nailed that timing. Uh, certainly better than I am and most people with the time. That was yeah, terrific. Well done. So um, GAMCorp uh, actually have been involved in a lot of the things that you guys have been referring to day to day. For example, the manuals from Clenergy and other, other uh, manufacturers of racking, they've often relied on either the expertise or GAMCorp, or even in some cases, we've seen some people copy their stuff, which without attribution. Uh, so uh, GAMCorp has really been uh, involved in this industry for a long period of time. And where you'd logically involve someone like GAMCorp is in that structural assessment and looking at uh, particularly those larger projects. If you haven't been doing that before, a uh, great first point of call to talk with them about what sorts of things you're going to need to uh, get to know. Uh, so that could be as simple as understanding what data you need to collect about the building as an initial stage. Um, when you're doing the quoting with a house, it's rare that you would measure the beams or look at the spacing of these sorts of things, uh, but that can be more important uh, with the commercial assessments. So thanks very much uh, for that, Senna. Uh, I'm now just going to uh, share a quick screen here as we as we wrap up here. So basically uh, the way this is going to go is that um, we will have some Q&A. Uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you that have attended. I really do appreciate you making the time because um, it's not um, it's not something that's easy to do in, in these busy days uh, to get time and have a look at this. I hope you have found that you've learned some things from those presentations. Uh, just to recap again, the uh, CPD points uh, will be coming through uh, and if you could send that uh, to uh, Kiara, the uh, contact details are there on the screen. Now, we'd just like to now dip into the Q&A. So the Q&A um, is coming from uh, the box at the bottom of the screen, uh, which, which details the Q&A um, information. And uh, I'm, I'm just going to, um, just having some difficulty accessing that box just at the minute. Uh, but one of the questions in the Q&A was the, Oh, okay, sorry, it has popped off there. But um, basically in the Q&A, we have some questions um, ready to go. And uh, one of the questions there is uh, the layout or the clamping zone for the Tiger 440 panels. And uh, Dan has um, reached out to Paul and said uh, to email him uh, at dan1.su at jinkosolar.com. Uh, but I'm just gonna quickly show that on the screen for you guys. Uh, so just going back to that. Okay, so so on the screen there, what you will see is a table and a chart for the long side installation. So when we're talking about uh, where the clamping clamps are going, uh, we do talk about the short side and the long side. So most of you are mounting on the long side. Uh, so typically that would be a portrait installation and your clamps would be positioned on those 1.7, 1.8 liter long stretches of the frame. And different placement of clamps gives you different acceptable pressures. So if you're in a wind region A or B, uh, then you're gonna have a quite flexible range of placement for those uh, for that um, clamp. And, and you can see that uh, we can choose, for example, the blue or red zones in that, in that pressure circumstance. And that will give us quite a wide range of uh, 
distances from the end of the panel as to where we can place our clamps. So you could, for example, place place your uh, clamp zero into, for example, 510 uh, or, or, or so on. So um, if you have a question about your particular circumstance, uh, Dan can answer that on dan1.su at jinkosolar.com. So that is uh, the question about uh, the clamping spacement for the Tiger Pro. Now, there's also been a question here about what are the benefits of the all black? Uh, the first thing I would say about the all black is that um, the all black has some carbon in the back sheet. The all black can actually last longer and we do offer a longer warranty on that of 25 years. Uh, there is a penalty though with the all black is that typically black is a better absorber of heat and it does mean the panels operate a little bit hotter. So we have, we have used the same cells that we make a 400 watt panel to make the 390 to counteract that. Uh, but in general, the benefit of the all black product is that it aesthetically looks better and it also has a better performance with respect to UV degradation of the plastic materials. And there was also a question from, uh, from Sai, uh, who was asking about the PID testing. So all of the modules that we're producing here have uh, anti-PID certification. Uh, what we have done specifically on the panels is in the Tiger Pro 440, we have used the POE encapsulant, which helps to better keep out moisture when compared to EVA. And with respect to the N-type panel, it's more resilient to the LID and PID effects anyway, but obviously we have tested for that as mentioned by Dan in the responses there. So I'm just seeing that uh, I don't have any further questions here in the chat box. Uh, so I'm just wondering uh, if there are questions out there or just um, open that up to you guys to put your questions in the chat box while we're winding down the Q&A session. Uh, I will myself ask a question to Daniel Sullivan who's still on the line. Um, so just wondering, uh, Daniel, if, uh, yes. if you could unmute yourself, which I see you've done, fantastic. So uh, Daniel, uh, would it be fair to say that uh, using the FormBay platform is the quickest way to verify Jinko serial numbers? If you're an installer, is that the most direct way to have serial numbers uh, verified? Would it be quicker or more accurate in some respect? Uh, so there's a number of app providers in the market that are approved to provide um, their, their or that basically are approved on the VSP um, service on SPV. So I think it's um, Green uh, Bridge Select, Greenbot, and Green Deal and Formbay have apps, um, and we have Demand Manager and Green Energy Trading. Uh, have been approved as well. There have been other participants that have um, sought to, to uh, uh, become an improved app provider, but we've um, but there's there's it's a very stringent process in terms of um, how you can be approved. So it's a very um, the integrity of who can be on the services is closely monitored. Um, so yeah, so it is the fastest way to verify your app. Um, I like to think that Porn Bay provides the best um, service in terms of scanning barcodes and verifying against the Jinko panels. Um, we have a direct relationship, obviously, with Jinko. Jinko uh, makes sure that all the all the all the serials that do come into the country, um, all the containers that do, or panels that do come into the country, are the, the flash test data for those panels are uploaded immediately, which is fantastic. Um, and it's it's got a great success rate. It's, um, it's really working out well. So yeah. Thank, th thank you very much, Daniel. So um, just to recap, um, that's something that you can use when you're talking to end users or potential buyers of solar systems that you have a process for verifying the panels you're using are genuine. And uh, that possibly is true for lots of panels in the market, but make sure you do point that out. Um, if you went to buy a car and it had airbags and other cars had airbags, they would point that out to you. Uh, so make sure you're sharing that to your customer and reinforcing the steps that you've taken. Um, you've verified that the, your supplier, Jinko Solar, uh, has a platform and a process for continuing to supply legitimate, valid product to the market that is authentic. Um, so I've just got a question for Sana um, about the uh, common uh, issue now. We're doing larger systems. We're possibly using cranes or other methods to get panels up onto the roof, maybe a helicopter even in some projects. Um, what are the implications around uh, pallet load drops on roof areas? Yeah, absolutely, Thomas. Um, 
look, it's becoming a concern for us more than anything because we're, you know, some of these pallets now with the bigger panels as well can be up to seven, 800 kilograms by the time you're putting, you know, your array frames and your panels in different pallets and dropping on roofs. Um, if the weight isn't distributed over multiple purlins and some people are just dropping them without, without having to doing too much checks in the background. I think the one thing everyone needs to know is that a building hasn't been designed, most buildings, I should say, unless it's a, you know, quite a firm concrete roof, hasn't been designed for an 800 kilogram load over a couple of square meters to drop on a roof. And if you are looking at, you know, craning and helicoptering pallets on roofs, make sure you get some engineer to, to check that that roof is capable of, you know, at least spreading that load over a few structural elements to be able to withstand that massive amount of load. Okay, thank you very much, Senna. Um, the other thing that I would just share from the Jinko perspective is that there are three other things to look at. So when we're craning panels onto the roof, uh, the first thing we want to understand is, is there some kind of sling being used that will put pressure on the top of the pallets? And have you got an appropriate arrangement to stop that uh, sling crimping in on the top of the pallet? Uh, so there may be some spreader bars there. There are also rules about the use of spreader bars, so you do need to be careful on that. Uh, but there has to be some thought about if you're going to use the typical slings, which might have a tube coming under the pallet, that there is something to withstand that pressure at the top from any uh, ropes that might tend to want to push in on the top of the pallet. The other thing to think about is the restraint of the pallets on the vehicles. So if you are using, for example, a trailer to carry 20 panels to a typical job site, uh, we would look for those panels to be restrained within the trailer. Uh, there has been a couple of accidents last year uh, with respect to panels flying out of trailers that are going to residential installations. There have also been problems with trailer sway. So what can sometimes happen is that with larger jobs that we start to do, we get a tow bar installed, we get that trailer put in. Now the apprentice is driving the vehicle with the trailer, but they have had no training on trailer sway. So we'd encourage um, installers and contractors to make sure that all the people driving with trailers have had appropriate training in how to handle those loads being pulled by the vehicle. And finally, uh, the drop sites that Santa was talking about, they're often on a slope. So we had a case last year where a crane was used to put panels onto a building and the panels uh, were dropped on the building such that the panels would naturally want to swing down the roof uh, so if you had a slope, first of all, you would want to have some way to restrain the panels uh, once they have been lodged onto the roof. And secondly, we generally would not want to have the, the large flat face of the panel facing to the gutter. We would want to have the ends of the panel such that they would not flop about. Um, if you have, for example, the large long face of the panel facing towards the gutter and you cut that open or in some way the panels are pulled out, it will cause that potentially to tip if it's on a residential roof with a 20 degree pitch. So do take some care and think about how the panels are going to stay in the box once that has been lodged onto the roof. Now, generally for residential, we would recommend that you use a lifter or you pass them up from a platform such as a scaffold. Uh, such that you do not have a full pallet going onto a residential roof. Okay, now <laughs> the other thing is that um, uh, we would probably like to see with Santa if there's any um, if there's any uh, rail manufacturers that they recommend for particular panels. Or, um, or what processes people should uh, undertake when they're evaluating the provider of a railing system? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I, I, I can't personally say that there is any one rail manufacturer that you know is, is far beyond anyone else. What I would, the advice I would give is to, to ensure that the rail manufacturer you do choose to use has done significant amount of testing and, and that they have you know ensured that their, their rails have been checked or by a structural engineer for its own deflection and, and the clamps have been checked against the roof sheeting type that you're installing on. Uh, the, the biggest problem we've seen in the industry is where clamps are not really uh, engaging to the roof structure well, uh, to the concealed roof structures in particular, and people are installing them, you know, the wrong clamp, you know, a clip, a clip lock 400 clamp for a clip lock 700 roof sheet and vice versa. So make sure the, the rail manufacturer using has done suitable testing for both the connection to the roof and for their rails themselves. Uh, that's commonly known as your general certificates, as you guys will use them. 
Um, but if you are, another thing I would suggest is if you are doing a larger site, like many of the bigger solar companies, the commercial installers these days, they'll do a site specific check as well. They'll check, uh, you know, what are the conditions for that rail or for that array frame type uh, on their site. And if it differs to a standard, you know, conventional uh, general certificates outcomes. Right. And Sana, if I could add another follow up question um, in Kalbarri in Western Australia, we've seen there, some cyclones come through areas that, what's that? Seems like my internet's cutting up. Okay, so my side, it's showing the voices coming through, is it not? Okay. Yeah, I think it's okay. Thomas, you may just continue. Okay, I think Santa might have just had a little bit of trouble with the internet connection there. Um, so basically my point here is that in Kalbarri, it was not a region D area, but they have faced region D cyclones. And I'm wondering if there's any need for us to be careful in other similar regions in Australia, or if you know of any regions which are not currently considered cyclonic, but in the face of this issue. Yeah, uh, I'd just yeah, like to top up on that question um, is probably for Sena is like we always get inquiries say is your module being rated for wing region D, uh, which is difficult for us is the module where we only provide the, um, the mechanical loading data of a particular module, which we consider both performance and uh, also uh, the structure integrity of the frame, right? So, but it's just for the module only. So yeah, um, so going back to Thomas and Senna, so if you wanna talk base, touch base on this uh, uh, wing region D issues, uh, like what is the correct way moving forward if, we, if, if people need to install a module in the high in the cyclone region? Yeah, okay. Well, we might we might take that offline just with the difficulty um, with, with Santa's connection there, but um, we would be pleased to answer any questions for installers with respect to Region D and Region C installation sites. Um, we do have the testing that we can share through. Uh, so that can be reached uh, via dan1.su at jinkosolar.com. So that email address, dan1.su at jinkosolar.com. Just a question uh, for Rene uh, Ubrix, if I if I may. Um, I'm just checking that uh, Rene is there because we've all politely got our video turned off, and I can see Rene's freed up his mic there. So I just wanted to ask a question there um, for you, Rene, with with respect to the grid uh, protection systems. Uh, is your company also able to introduce the people who do things like witness testing or anything like that? Or how can we best go about getting that secondary testing completed once we've installed a grid protection device? Yeah, so you're referring to the injection test at the, at the, um, at the end of the job. Uh, yes, we, yes, we do have um, people that, you know, will, will be outsourced, but rather than, you know, we've got contacts that we can uh, engage those people and, and, help you with that part of your test for your DSPN. Yes. Great. Okay. Thanks very much, Rene. So um, just important to understand that if you haven't done grid protection before, uh, there is the front end cost potentially to design and install the uh, grid protection system. There may typically be some additional uh, application costs with the grid or network provider. And finally, mm -hmm. there might be a test required witness testing. So um, thanks for that. Rene can help you with that. Yeah, and, and not only that, them, uh, some even require nowadays to do a voltage test as well, um, some DSPNs. So that could be ranging from a couple of hours with the solar on and the solar off, or it could even be, you know, like a, like a week. And we here in Victoria, we now start to see even some DSPNs now require to do a week long test even before we even start to install a solar system. So um, there's some, some people, yeah, once you start to get into the commercial field, uh, be mindful of, of these requirements that the DSPN is going to put on you. Um, but if, if people, uh, we can assist them with, with you know, that as well to help that, to push through that application for them if they wish to do so. Okay, and just, just if I could follow up with a question there, Rene. So that voltage mm -hmm. testing that you're talking about, you, you mentioned you, you can do that, uh, but yes. uh, that 
does it require a third party engineer or it, it can actually be done by the contractor themselves if they I, have the equipment? They can do it at themselves. It's not uh, really required to be done by an engineer. Um, but yeah, just mostly, well, here in Victoria, what I'm aware of, um, an, an, an electrician can do that himself as well. Um, the DSPN here requires sort of like a five minute window. So you've got to record every five minutes your voltage levels and then submit that to them, um, you know, in a CSV file so that they can analyze that. And uh, does that typically mean that the site needs to be shut down to install the test equipment or can that be done without shutting the site down? Well, you got to, you're not supposed to work live. So, um, you know, that could require to, to shut down uh, the site if you need to install a data logger um, because you need to, you know, install that somewhere near the switchboard uh, as close as possible to your point of connection. So if, if there is no uh, circuit breakers available, you know, you'll have to work live on a board. Unfortunately, you will have to shut down the, uh, the switchboard in order to install it safely. So, so from what, what you're saying, it wouldn't be possible to, for example, use a uh, outlet such as a three phase outlet or a, or a if it's quite installed, video, uh, yeah, a close nearby, you, you could use that. But yeah, you need to get it as close as possible, need a point of connection. Right. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think that brings to conclusion the Q and A section. Uh, we do really appreciate uh, our presenters uh, today. Um, really appreciate Sana, Rene. Uh, Daniel and Dan uh, making the time and we appreciate you as an audience as installers and members of the industry for taking time with us today. Um, I've been Thomas Bywater for Jinko Solar Australia. We've really enjoyed today's presentation. Look forward to seeing you on the next one. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.